Welcome to the J.W. Jupiter Readers Theater, which proudly presents the first three chapters of White Fang by Jack London. These chapters are a self-contained short story within the larger novel, only loosely connected to White Fang himself. Yet, they serve as a harrowing and entirely unforgettable introduction to the setting, the unforgiving and murderous Northland Wild. But London says it far better, so do not get too far out in front of the pleasure and presence of the work of art itself. Chapter One, The Trail of the Meat. Dark spruce forest frowned on either side the frozen waterway. The trees had been stripped by a recent wind of their white covering of frost and they seemed to lean toward each other, black and ominous in the fading light. A vast silence reigned over the land. The land itself was a desolation, lifeless, without movement, so lone and cold that the spirit of it was not even that of sadness. There was a hint in it of laughter, but of a laughter more terrible than any sadness, a laughter that was mirthless as the smile of the sphinx, a laughter cold as the frost and partaking of the grimness of infallibility. It was the masterful and incommunicable wisdom of eternity, laughing at the futility of life and the effort of life. It was the wild, the savage, frozen-hearted, Northland wild. But there was life abroad in the land and defiant. Down the frozen waterway toiled a string of wolfish dogs. Their bristly fur was rhymed with frost. Their breath froze in the air as it left their mouths, spouting forth in spumes of vapor that settled upon the hair of their bodies and formed into crystals of frost. Leather harness was on the dogs, and leather traces attached them to a sled, which dragged along behind. The sled was without runners. It was made of stout birch bark, and its full surface rested on the snow. The front end of the sled was turned up, like a scroll, in order to force down and under the bore of soft snow that surged like a wave before it. On the sled, securely lashed, was a long and narrow oblong box. There were other things on the sled, blankets and axe and a coffee pot and frying pan, but prominent, occupying most of the space, was the long and narrow oblong box. In advance of the dogs on wide snowshoes toiled a man. At the rear of the sled toiled a second man. On the sled, in the box, lay a third man whose toil was over a man whom the wild had conquered and beaten down until he would never move nor struggle again. It is not the way of the wild to like movement. Life is an offense to it, for life is movement, and the wild aims always to destroy movement. It freezes the water to prevent it running to the sea. It drives the sap out of the trees till they are frozen to their mighty hearts. And most ferociously and terribly of all does the wild harry and crush into submission man. Man, who is the most restless of life, ever in revolt against the dictum that all movement must, in the end, come to the cessation of movement. But at front and rear, unawed and indomitable, toiled the two men who were not yet dead. Their bodies were covered with fur and soft tanned leather. Eyelashes and cheeks and lips were so coated with the crystals from their frozen breath that their faces were not discernible. This gave them the seeming of ghostly masks, Undertakers in a spectral world at the funeral of some ghost. But under it all they were men, penetrating the land of desolation and mockery and silence. Puny adventurers bent on colossal adventure, 
pitting themselves against the might of a world as remote and alien and pulseless as the abysses of space. They traveled on without speech, saving their breath for the work of their bodies. On every side was the silence, pressing upon them with a tangible presence. It affected their minds as the many atmospheres of deep water affect the body of the diver. It crushed them with the weight of unending vastness and unalterable decree. It crushed them into the remotest recesses of their own minds, pressing out of them like juices from the grape. All the false ardors and exaltations and undue self-values of the human soul until they perceive themselves finite and small, specks and motes, moving with weak cunning and little wisdom amidst the play and interplay of the great blind elements and forces. An hour went by, and a second hour. The pale light of the short sunless day was beginning to fade, when a faint far cry arose on the still air. It soared upward with a swift rush, till it reached its topmost note where it persisted, palpitant and tense, and then slowly died away. It might have been a lost soul wailing, had it not been invested with a certain sad fierceness and hungry eagerness. The front man turned his head until his eyes met the eyes of the man behind. And then, across the narrow oblong box, each nodded to the other. A second cry arose, piercing the silence with needle-like shrillness. Both men located the sound. It was to the rear, somewhere in the snow expanse they had just traversed. A third and answering cry arose, also to the rear and to the left of the second cry. They're after us, Bill, said the man at the front. His voice sounded hoarse and unreal, and he had spoken with apparent effort. Meat is scarce, answered his comrade. I ain't seen a rabbit sign for days. Thereafter they spoke no more, though their ears were keen for the hunting cries that continued to rise behind them. At the fall of darkness they swung the dogs into a cluster of spruce trees on the edge of the waterway and made a camp. The coffin, at the sight of the fire, served for a seat and table. The wolf dogs, clustered on the far side of the fire, snarled and bickered among themselves, but evinced no inclination to stray off into the darkness. Seems to me, Henry, they're staying remarkable close to camp, Bill commented. Henry, squatting over the fire and settling the pot of coffee with a piece of ice, nodded. Nor did he speak till he had taken his seat on the coffin and begun to eat. They know where their hides is safe, he said. They'd sooner eat grub than be grub. They're pretty wise, them dogs. Bill shook his head. Oh, I don't know. His comrade looked at him curiously. First time I ever heard you say anything about their not being wise. Henry, said the other, munching with deliberation the beans he was eating. Did you happen to notice the way them dogs kicked up when I was a-feeding them? They did cut up more than usual, Henry acknowledged. How many dogs have we got, Henry? Six. Well, Henry... Bill stopped for a moment in order that his words might gain greater significance. As I was saying, Henry, we've got six dogs. I took six fish out of the bag. I gave one fish to each dog, and Henry, I was one fish short. You counted wrong. We've got six dogs, the other reiterated dispassionately. I took out six fish. One ear didn't get no fish. I came back to the bag afterward and got him his fish. We've only got six dogs, Henry said. Henry, Bill went on, I won't say they was all dogs, 
but there was seven of them that got fish. Henry stopped eating to glance across the fire and counted the dogs. There's only six now, he said. I saw the other one run off across the snow, Bill announced with cool positiveness. I saw seven. His comrade looked at him commiseratingly and said, I'll be almighty glad when this trip's over. What do you mean by that? Bill demanded. I mean that this load of iron is getting on your nerves and that you're beginning to see things. I thought of that, Bill answered gravely, and so when I saw it run off across the snow, I looked in the snow and saw its tracks. Then I counted the dogs and there were still six of them. The tracks is there in the snow now. Do you want to look at them? I'll show them to you. Henry did not reply, but munched on in silence until, the meal finished, he topped it with a final cup of coffee. He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand and said, Then you're thinking as it was, a long wailing cry fiercely sad from somewhere in the darkness had interrupted him. He stopped to listen to it. Then he finished his sentence with a wave of his hand toward the sound of the cry. One of them. Bill nodded. I'd a blame sight sooner think that than anything else. You noticed yourself the row the dogs made. Cry after cry and answering cries were turning the silence into a bedlam. From every side the cries arose and the dogs betrayed their fear by huddling together and so close to the fire that their hair was scorched by the heat. Bill threw on more wood before lighting his pipe. I'm thinking you're down in the mouth some, Henry said. Henry, he sucked meditatively on his pipe for some time before he went on. Henry, I was a thinking what a blame sight luckier he is than you and me'll ever be. He indicated the third person by a downward thrust of the thumb to the box on which they sat. You and me, Henry, would we die? We'll be lucky if we get enough stones over our carcasses to keep the dogs off of us. We ain't got people and money and all like the rest, like him, Henry rejoined. Long distance funerals are something you and me can't exactly afford. What gets me, Henry? Is what a chap like this, that's a lord or something in his own country, and that's never had to bother about grub nor blankets, why he comes a button round the godforsaken ends of the earth. That's what I can't exactly see. He might have lived to a ripe old age if he'd stayed to home, Henry agreed. Bill opened his mouth to speak, but changed his mind. Instead, he pointed toward the wall of darkness that pressed about them from every side. There was no suggestion of form in the utter blackness. Only could be seen a pair of eyes gleaming like live coals. Henry indicated with his head a second pair and a third. A circle of the gleaming eyes had drawn about their camp. Now and again a pair of eyes moved or disappeared to appear again a moment later. The unrest of the dogs had been increasing and they stampeded in a surge of sudden fear to the near side of the fire, cringing and crawling about the legs of the men. In the scramble, one of the dogs had been overturned on the edge of the fire, and it had yelped with pain and fright as the smell of its singed coat possessed the air. The commotion caused the circle of eyes to shift restlessly for a moment, and even to withdraw a bit, but it settled down again as the dogs became quiet. Henry, it's a blame misfortune to be out of ammunition. Bill had finished his pipe and was helping his companion spread the bed of fur and blanket upon the spruce boughs, which he had laid over the snow before supper. Henry grunted and began unlacing his moccasins. How many cartridges did you say you had left? He asked. Three, came the answer, and I wished was three hundred. Then I'd show him what for, damn him! 
He shook his fist angrily at the gleaming eyes and began securely to prop his moccasins before the fire. And I wish this cold snap would break, he went on. It's been fifty below for two weeks now, and I wished I'd never started on this trip, Henry. I don't like the looks of it. I don't feel right somehow. And while I'm wishing, I wish this trip was over and done with, and you and me are sitting by the fire in Fort McGurry just about now and playing cribbage. That's what I wished. Henry grunted and crawled into bed. As he dozed off, he was aroused by his comrade's voice. Say, Henry, that other one that come in and got a fish, why didn't the dogs pitch into it? That's what's bothering me. You're bothering too much, Bill, came the sleepy response. You was never like this before. You just shut up now and go to sleep and you'll be all hunky-dory in the morning. Your stomach's sour. That's what's bothering you. The men slept, breathing heavily, side by side under the one covering. The fire died down, and the gleaming eyes drew closer the circle they had flung about the camp. The dogs clustered together in fear, now and again snarling menacingly as a pair of eyes drew close. Once their uproar became so loud that Bill woke up. He got out of bed carefully so as not to disturb the sleep of his comrade, and threw more wood on the fire. As it began to flame up, the circle of eyes drew farther back. He glanced casually at the huddling dogs. He rubbed his eyes and looked at them more sharply. Then he crawled back into the blankets. Henry, he said. Oh, Henry. Henry groaned as he passed from sleep to waking and demanded, What's, what's wrong now? Nothing came the answer. Only there's seven of them again. I just counted. Henry acknowledged receipt of the information with a grunt that slid into a snore as he drifted back into sleep. In the morning it was Henry who woke first and routed his companion out of bed. Daylight was yet three hours away, though it was already six o'clock, and in the darkness Henry went about preparing breakfast while Bill rolled the blankets and made the sled ready for lashing. "'Say, Henry,' he asked suddenly, "'how many dogs did you say we had?' Six. "'Wrong,' Bill proclaimed triumphantly. Seven again?' Henry queried. "'No. Five. One's gone.' "'The hell?' Henry cried in wrath, leaving the cooking to come and count the dogs. You're right, Bill, he concluded. Fatty's gone. And he went like grease lightning once he got started. Couldn't have seen him for smoke. No chance at all, Henry concluded. They just swallowed him alive. I bet he was yelping as he went down their throats, damn them. He always was a fool dog, said Bill. But no fool dog ought to be fool enough to go off and commit suicide that way. He looked over the remainder of the team with a speculative eye that summed up instantly the salient traits of each animal. I bet none of the others would do it. Couldn't drive him away from the fire with a club, Bill agreed. I always did think there was something wrong with Fatty anyway. And this was the epitaph of a dead dog on the Northland Trail, less scant than the epitaph of many another dog, of many a man. Chapter 2 The She-Wolf Breakfast eaten and the slim camp outfit lashed to the sled. The men turned their backs on the cheery fire and launched out into the darkness. At once began to rise the cries that were fiercely sad, cries that called through the darkness and cold to one another and answered back. Conversation ceased. Daylight came at nine o'clock. At midday the sky to the south warmed to rose color, 
and marked where the bulge of the earth intervened between the meridian sun and the northern world. But the rose color swiftly faded. The gray light of day that remained lasted until three o'clock, when it too faded, and the pall of the arctic night descended upon the lone and silent land. As darkness came on, the hunting cries to right and left and rear drew closer, so close that more than once they sent surges of fear through the toiling dogs, throwing them into short-lived panics. At the conclusion of one such panic, when he and Henry had got the dogs back in the traces, Bill said, I wish they'd strike game somewheres and go away and leave us alone. They do get on the nerves horrible, Henry sympathized. They spoke no more until camp was made. Henry was bending over and adding ice to the bubbling pot of beans when he was startled by the sound of a blow, an exclamation from Bill, and a sharp, snarling cry of pain from among the dogs. He straightened up in time to see a dim form disappearing across the snow into the shelter of the dark. Then he saw Bill, standing amid the dogs, half triumphant, half crestfallen, in one hand a stout club, in the other the tail and part of the body of a sun-cured salmon. It got half of it, he announced, but I got a whack at it just the same. Did you hear it squeal? What it looked like, Henry asked. Couldn't see, but it had four legs and a mouth and hair and looked like any dog. Must be a tame wolf, I reckon. It's damn tame, whatever it is, coming in here at feeding time and getting its whack of fish. That night, when supper was finished, and they sat on the oblong box and pulled at their pipes, the circle of gleaming eyes drew in even closer than before. I wish they'd spring up a bunch of moose or something and go away and leave us alone, Bill said. Henry grunted with an intonation that was not all sympathy, and for a quarter of an hour they sat on in silence. Henry staring at the fire and Bill at the circle of eyes that burned in the darkness just beyond the firelight. I wished we was pulling into McGurry right now, he began again. Shut up your wishing and your croaking, Henry burst out angrily. Your stomach's sour. That's what's ailing you. Swallow a spoonful of soda and you'll sweeten up wonderful and be more pleasant company. In the morning, Henry was aroused by fervid blasphemy that proceeded from the mouth of Bill. Henry propped himself up on an elbow and looked to see his comrade standing among the dogs beside the replenished fire, his arms raised in objurgation, his face distorted with passion. Hello, Henry called. What's up now? Frog's gone, came the answer. No. I tell you, yes. Henry leaped out of the blankets and to the dogs. He counted them with care, and then joined his partner in cursing the powers of the wild that had robbed them of another dog. Frog was the strongest dog of the bunch, Bill proclaimed finally. And he was no fool dog neither, Henry added. And so was recorded the second epitaph in two days. A gloomy breakfast was eaten, and the four remaining dogs were harnessed to the sled. The day was a repetition of the days that had gone before. The men toiled without speech across the face of the frozen world. The silence was unbroken, save by the cries of their pursuers that, unseen, hung upon their rear. With the coming of night in the mid-afternoon, the cries sounded closer as the pursuers drew in according to their custom, and the dogs grew excited and frightened and were guilty of panics that tangled the traces and further depressed the two men. There, that'll fix you fool critters, Bill said with satisfaction that night, standing erect at completion of his task. Henry left his cooking to come and see. Not only had his partner tied the dogs up, but he had tied them, after the Indian fashion, with sticks. About the neck of each dog he had fastened a leather thong. To this, and so close to the neck that the dog could not get his teeth to it, he had tied a stout stick four or five feet in length. The other end of the stick, in turn, was made fast to a stake in the ground by means of a leather thong. 
The dog was unable to gnaw through the leather at his own end of the stick. The stick prevented him from getting at the leather that fastened the other end. Henry nodded his head approvingly. It's the only contraption that'll ever hold one ear, he said. He can gnaw through leather as clean as a knife and just about half as quick. They'll all be here in the morning, hunky-dory. You just bet they will, Bill affirmed. If one of them turns up missing, I'll go without my coffee. They just know we ain't loaded to kill, Henry remarked at bedtime, indicating the gleaming circle that hemmed them in. If we could put a couple shots into them, they'd be more respectful. They come closer every night. Get the firelight out of your eyes and look hard. There, do you see that one? For some time, the two men amused themselves with watching the movement of vague forms on the edge of the firelight. By looking closely and steadily at where a pair of eyes burned in the darkness, the form of the animal would slowly take shape. They could even see these forms move at times. A sound among the dogs attracted the men's attention. One ear was uttering quick, eager whines, lunging at the length of his stick toward the darkness and desisting now and again in order to make frantic attacks on the stick with his teeth. Look at that, Bill, Henry whispered. Full into the firelight, with a stealthy, sidelong movement, glided a dog-like animal. It moved with commingled mistrust and daring, cautiously observing the men, its attention fixed on the dogs. One ear strained the full length of the stick toward the intruder, and whined with eagerness. That fool one ear don't seem scared much, Bill said in a low tone. It's a she-wolf, Henry whispered back. And that accounts for Fatty and Frog. She's the decoy for the pack. She draws out the dog, and then all the rest pitches in and eats him up. The fire crackled. A log fell apart with a loud, spluttering noise. At the sound of it, the strange animal leaped back into the darkness. Henry, I'm a-thinking, Bill announced. Thinking what? I'm a-thinking that was the one I lambasted with the club. Ain't the slightest doubt in the world, was Henry's response. And right here, I want to remark, Bill went on, that that animal's familiarity with campfires is suspicious and immoral. It knows for certain more than a self-respecting wolf ought to know, Henry agreed. A wolf that knows enough to come in with dogs at feeding time has had experiences. Old villain had a dog once that run away with the wolves, Bill cogitated aloud. I ought to know. I shot it out of the pack in a moose pasture over on Little Stick, and old villain cried like a baby, Hadn't seen it for three years, he said. Been with the wolves all that time. I reckon you've called the term, Bill. That wolf's a dog, and it's eaten fish many's the time from the hand of man. And if I get a chance at it, that wolf that's a dog will be just meat, Bill declared. We can't afford to lose no more animals. But you've only got three cartridges, Henry objected. I'll wait for a dead sure shot, was the reply. In the morning, Henry renewed the fire and cooked breakfast to the accompaniment of his partner's snoring. You was sleeping just too comfortable for anything, Henry told him as he routed him out for breakfast. I hadn't the heart to rouse you. Bill began to eat sleepily. He noticed that his cup was empty and started to reach for the pot but the pot was beyond arm's length and beside Henry. Say, Henry, he chided gently, ain't you forgot something? Henry looked about with great carefulness and shook his head. Bill held up the empty cup. You don't get no coffee, Henry announced. Ain't run out? Bill asked anxiously. Nope. Ain't thinking it'll hurt my digestion, Nope. A flush of angry blood pervaded Bill's face. Then it's just warm and anxious I am to be hearing you explain yourself, he said. Spanker's gone, 
Henry answered. Without haste, with the air of one resigned to misfortune, Bill turned his head, and from where he sat, counted the dogs. How'd it happen? he asked apathetically. Henry shrugged his shoulders. Don't know. Unless one ear gnawed him loose, he couldn't have done it himself, that's sure. The darned cuss, Bill spoke gravely and slowly, with no hint of the anger that was raging within. Just because he couldn't chew himself loose, he chews Spanker loose. Well, Spanker's troubles is over anyway. I guess he's digested by this time and cavorting over the landscape in the bellies of twenty different wolves was Henry's epitaph on this, the latest lost dog. Have some coffee, Bill. But Bill shook his head. Go on, Henry pleaded, elevating the pot. Bill shoved his cup aside. I'll be ding-dong danged if I do. I said I wouldn't if every dog turned up any missin', and I won't. It's darn good coffee, Henry said enticingly. But Bill was stubborn, and he ate a dry breakfast, washed down with mumbled curses at one ear for the trick he had played. I'll tie him up out of reach of each other tonight, Bill said as they took the trail. They had traveled little more than a hundred yards when Henry, who was in front, bent down and picked up something with which his snowshoe had collided. It was dark, and he could not see it, but he recognized it by the touch. He flung it back so that it struck the sled and bounced along until it fetched up on Bill's snowshoes. Maybe you'll need that in your business, Henry said. Bill uttered an exclamation. It was all that was left of Spanker, the stick with which he had been tied. They ate him hide and all, Bill announced. The stick's as clean as a whistle. They've ate the leather off on both ends. They're damn hungry, Henry, and they'll have you and me guessing before this trip's over. Henry laughed defiantly. I ain't been trailed this way by wolves before, but I've gone through a whole lot worse and kept my health. Takes more than a handful of them pesky critters to do for yours truly, Bill, my son. I don't know, I don't know, Bill muttered ominously. Well, you know all right when we pull into McGurry. I ain't feeling special enthusiastic, Bill persisted. You're off color, that's what's the matter with you, Henry dogmatized. What you need is quinine, and I'm going to dose you up as stiff as soon as we make McGurry. Bill grunted his disagreement with the diagnosis and lapsed into silence. The day was like all the days. Light came at nine o'clock. At twelve o'clock the southern horizon was warmed by the unseen sun and then began the cold gray of afternoon that would merge three hours later into night. It was just after the sun's futile effort to appear that Bill slipped the rifle from under the sled lashings and said, You keep right on, Henry. I'm going to see what I can see. You'd better stick by the sled, his partner protested. You've only got three cartridges, and there's no telling what might happen. Who's croaking now? Bill demanded triumphantly. Henry made no reply and plodded on alone, though often he cast anxious glances back into the gray solitude where his partner had disappeared. An hour later, taking advantage of the cutoffs around which the sled had to go, Bill arrived. They're scattered and ranging along wide, he said, keeping up with us and looking for game at the same time. You see, they're sure of us, only they know they've got to wait to get us. In the meantime, they're willing to pick up anything eatable that comes handy. You mean they think they're sure of us, Henry objected pointedly. But Bill ignored him. I seen some of them. They're pretty thin. They ain't had a bite in weeks, I reckon, outside of Fatty and Frog and Spanker. And there's so many of them that that didn't go far. They're remarkable thin. Their ribs is like washboards and their stomachs is right up against their backbones. They're pretty desperate, I can tell you. They'll be going mad yet and then watch out. A few minutes later, 
Henry, who was now traveling behind the sled, emitted a low, warning whistle. Bill turned and looked, then quietly stopped the dogs. To the rear, from around the last bend and plainly into view, on the very trail they had just covered, trotted a furry, slinking form. Its nose was to the trail, and it trotted with a peculiar, sliding, effortless gait. When they halted, it halted, throwing up its head and regarding them steadily with nostrils that twitched as it caught and studied the scent of them. It's the she-wolf, Bill whispered. The dogs had lain down in the snow, and he walked past them to join his partner at the sled. Together they watched the strange animal that had pursued them for days and that had already accomplished the destruction of half their dog team. After a searching scrutiny, the animal trotted forward a few steps. This it repeated several times, till it was a short hundred yards away. It paused, head up, close by a clump of spruce trees, and with sight and scent studied the outfit of the watching men. It looked at them in a strangely wistful way, after the manner of a dog. But in its wistfulness there was none of the dog affection. It was a wistfulness bred of hunger, as cruel as its own fangs, as merciless as the frost itself. It was large for a wolf, its gaunt frame advertising the lines of an animal that was among the largest of its kind. Stands pretty close to two feet and a half at the shoulders, Henry commented, and I'll bet it ain't far from five feet long. Kind of strange color for a wolf, was Bill's criticism. I never seen a red wolf before. Looks almost cinnamon to me. The animal was certainly not cinnamon colored. Its coat was the true wolf coat. The dominant color was gray, and yet there was to it a faint reddish hue, a hue that was baffling, that appeared and disappeared, that was more like an illusion of the vision, now gray, distinctly gray, and again giving hints and glints of a vague redness of color, not classifiable in terms of ordinary experience. Looks for all the world like a big husky sled dog, Bill said. I wouldn't be surprised to see it wag its tail. Hello, you husky, he called. Come here, you whatever your name is. Ain't a bit scared of you, Henry laughed. Bill waved his hand at it threateningly and shouted loudly, but the animal betrayed no fear. The only change in it that they could notice was an accession of alertness. It still regarded them with the merciless wistfulness of hunger. They were meat, and it was hungry and it would like to go in and eat them if it dared. Look here, Henry, Bill said, unconsciously lowering his voice to a whisper because of what he meditated. We've got three cartridges, but it's a dead shot. Couldn't miss it. It's got away with three of our dogs, and we ought to put a stop to it. What do you say? Henry nodded his consent. Bill cautiously slipped the gun from under the sled lashing, the gun was on the way to his shoulder, but it never got there. For in that instant the she-wolf leaped sideways from the trail into the clump of spruce trees and disappeared. The two men looked at each other. Henry whistled long and comprehendingly. I might have known it, Bill chided himself aloud as he replaced the gun. Of course a wolf that knows enough to come in with the dogs at feeding time know all about shooting irons. I tell you right now, Henry, that crit is the cause of all our trouble. We'd have six dogs at the present time instead of three if it wasn't for her. And I tell you right now, Henry, I'm going to get her. She's too smart to be shot in the open, but I'm going to lay for her. I'll bushwhack her as sure as my name is Bill. You needn't stray off too far in doing it, his partner admonished. If that pack ever starts to jump you... Them three cartridges be worth no more than three whoops on hell. Them animals is damn hungry, and once they start in, they'll sure get you, Bill. They camped early that night. Three dogs could not drag the sled so fast nor for so long hours as could six, 
and they were showing unmistakable signs of playing out. And the men went early to bed, Bill first seeing to it that the dogs were tied out of gnawing reach of one another. But the wolves were growing bolder, and the men were aroused more than once from their sleep. So near did the wolves approach that the dogs became frantic with terror, and it was necessary to replenish the fire from time to time in order to keep the adventurous marauders at safer distance. I've heard sailors talk of sharks following a ship, Bill remarked, as he crawled back into the blankets after one such replenishing of the fire. Well, them wolves is land sharks. They know their business better than we do, and they ain't a-holdin' our trail this way for their health. They're going to get us. They're sure going to get us, Henry. They've half got you already, a talking like that, Henry retorted sharply. A man's half licked when he says he is, and you're half eaten from the way you're going on about it. They've got away with better men than you and me, Bill answered. Oh, shut up, you're croaking. You make me all fired tired. Henry rolled over angrily on his side, but was surprised that Bill made no similar display of temper. This was not Bill's way for he was easily angered by sharp words. Henry thought long over it before he went to sleep, and as his eyelids fluttered down and he dozed off, the thought in his mind was, There's no mistake in it, Bill's almighty blue. I'll have to cheer him up tomorrow. Chapter 3 The Hunger Cry the day began auspiciously. They had lost no dogs during the night, and they swung out upon the trail into the silence, the darkness, and the cold, with spirits that were fairly light. Bill seemed to have forgotten his forebodings of the previous night, and even waxed facetious with the dogs when, at midday, they overturned the sled on a bad piece of trail. It was an awkward mix-up. The sled was upside down and jammed between a tree trunk and a huge rock, and they were forced to unharness the dogs in order to straighten out the tangle. The two men were bent over the sled and trying to right it, when Henry observed one ear sidling away. "'Here, you! One ear!' he cried, straightening up and turned around on the dog. But one ear broke into a run across the snow, his traces trailing behind him. And there, out in the snow of their back track, was the she-wolf waiting for him. As he neared her, he became suddenly cautious. He slowed down to an alert and mincing walk, and then stopped. He regarded her carefully and dubiously, yet desirefully. She seemed to smile at him, showing her teeth in an ingratiating rather than a menacing way. She moved toward him a few steps, playfully, and then halted. One ear drew near to her, still alert and cautious, his tail and ears in the air, his head held high. He tried to sniff noses with her, but she retreated playfully and coyly. Every advance on his part was accompanied by a corresponding retreat on her part. Step by step, she was luring him away from the security of his human companionship. Once as though a warning had in vague ways flitted through his intelligence. He turned his head and looked back at the overturned sled, at his teammates, and at the two men who were calling to him. But whatever idea was forming in his mind was dissipated by the she-wolf, who advanced upon him, sniffed noses with him for a fleeting instant, and then resumed her coy retreat before his renewed advances. In the meantime... Bill had bethought himself of the rifle, but it was jammed beneath the overturned sled, and by the time Henry had helped him to right the load, One Ear and the She-Wolf were too close together and the distance too great to risk a shot. Too late, One Ear learned his mistake. Before they saw the cause, the two men saw him turn and start to run back toward them, then, approaching at right angles to the trail and cutting off his retreat, they saw a dozen wolves, lean and gray, bounding across the snow. On the instant, 
The she-wolf's coyness and playfulness disappeared. With a snarl she sprang upon one ear. He thrust her off with his shoulder, and his retreat cut off and still intent on regaining the sled, he altered his course in an attempt to circle around to it. More wolves were appearing every moment and joining in the chase. The she-wolf was one leap behind one ear and holding her own. "'Where are you going?' Henry suddenly demanded, laying his hand on his partner's arm. Bill shook it off. "'I won't stand it,' he said. "'They ain't a-going to get any more of our dogs if I can help it.' Gun in hand, he plunged into the underbrush that lined the side of the trail. His intention was apparent enough. Taking the sled as the center of the circle that one ear was making, Bill planned to tap that circle at a point in advance of the pursuit. With his rifle in the broad daylight, it might be possible for him to awe the wolves and save the dog. Say, Bill, Henry called after him. Be careful. Don't take no chances. Henry sat down on the sled and watched. There was nothing else for him to do. Bill had already gone from sight, but now and again, appearing and disappearing amongst the underbrush and the scattered clumps of spruce, could be seen one ear. Henry judged his case to be hopeless. The dog was thoroughly alive to its danger, but it was running on the outer circle, while the wolf pack was running on the inner and shorter circle. It was vain to think of one ear so outdistancing his pursuers as to be able to cut across their circle in advance of them and to regain the sled. The different lines were rapidly approaching a point. Somewhere out there in the snow, screened from his sight by trees and thickets, Henry knew that the wolf pack, One Ear, and Bill were coming together. All too quickly, far more quickly than he had expected, it happened. He heard a shot, then two shots in rapid succession, and he knew that Bill's ammunition was gone. Then he heard a great outcry of snarls and yelps. He recognized One Ear's yell of pain and terror, and he heard a wolf cry that bespoke a stricken animal. And that was all. The snarls ceased. The yelping died away. Silence settled down again over the lonely land. He sat for a long while upon the sled, there was no need for him to go and see what had happened. He knew it as though it had taken place before his eyes. Once he roused with a start and hastily got the axe out from underneath the lashings. But for some time longer he sat and brooded, the two remaining dogs crouching and trembling at his feet. At last he arose in a weary manner, as though all the resilience had gone out of his body and proceeded to fasten the dogs to the sled. He passed a rope over his shoulder, a man-trace, and pulled with the dogs. He did not go far. At the first hint of darkness he hastened to make a camp, and he saw to it that he had a generous supply of firewood. He fed the dogs, cooked and ate his supper, and made his bed close to the fire. But he was not destined to enjoy that bed. Before his eyes closed, the wolves had drawn too near for safety. It no longer required an effort of the vision to see them. They were all about him in the fire, in a narrow circle, and he could see them plainly in the firelight, lying down, sitting up, crawling forward on their bellies or slinking back and forth. They even slept. Here and there he could see one curled up in the snow like a dog taking the sleep that was now denied himself. He kept the fire brightly blazing, for he knew that it alone intervened between the flesh of his body and their hungry fangs. His two dogs stayed close by him, one on either side, leaning against him for protection, crying and whimpering, and at times snarling desperately when a wolf approached a little closer than usual. At such moments... When his dogs snarled, the whole circle would be agitated, the wolves coming to their feet and pressing tentatively forward, a chorus of snarls and eager yelps rising about him. Then the circle would lie down again, and here and there a wolf would resume its broken nap. 
But this circle had a continuous tendency to draw in upon him, bit by bit, an inch at a time, with here a wolf bellying forward and there a wolf bellying forward, the circle would narrow until the brutes were almost within springing distance. Then he would seize brands from the fire and hurl them into the pack. A hasty drawing back always resulted, accompanied by angry yelps and frightened snarls when a well-aimed brand struck and scorched a too daring animal. Morning found the man haggard and worn, wide-eyed from want of sleep, he cooked breakfast in the darkness, and at nine o'clock, when, with the coming of daylight, the wolf pack drew back, he set upon the task he had planned through the long hours of the night. Chopping down young saplings, he made them crossbars of a scaffold by lashing them high up to the trunks of standing trees. Using the sled lashing for a heaving rope, and with the aid of the dogs, he hoisted the coffin to the top of the scaffold. They got Bill, and they may get me, but they'll sure never get you, young man, he said, addressing the dead body in its tree sepulchre. Then he took the trail, the lightened sled bounding along behind the willing dogs, for they too knew that safety lay only in the gaining of Fort McGurry. The wolves were now more open in their pursuit, trotting sedately behind and ranging along on either side, their red tongues lolling out, their lean sides showing the undulating ribs with every movement. They were very lean, mere skin bags stretched over bony frames with strings for muscles, so lean that Henry found it in his mind to marvel that they still kept their feet and did not collapse forthright in the snow. He did not dare travel after dark, at midday, not only did the sun warm the southern horizon, but it even thrust its upper rim pale and golden above the skyline. He received it as a sign. The days were growing longer, the sun was returning, but scarcely had the cheer of its light departed than when he went into camp. There were still several hours of gray daylight and somber twilight, and he utilized them in chopping an enormous supply of firewood. With night came horror. Not only were the starving wolves growing bolder, but lack of sleep was telling upon Henry. He dozed despite himself, crouching by the fire, the blankets about his shoulders, the axe between his knees, and on either side a dog pressing close against him. He awoke once and saw in front of him, not a dozen feet away, a big gray wolf, one of the largest of the pack. And even as he looked, the brute deliberately stretched himself after the manner of a lazy dog, yawning full in his face and looking upon him with a possessive eye, as if, in truth, he were merely a delayed meal that was soon to be eaten. This certitude was shown by the whole pack. Fully a score he could count staring hungrily at him or calmly sleeping in the snow, they reminded him of children gathered about a spread table and awaiting permission to begin to eat. And he was the food they were to eat. He wondered how and when the meal would begin. As he piled wood on the fire, he discovered an appreciation of his own body which he had never felt before. He watched his moving muscles and was interested in the cunning mechanism of his fingers. By the light of the fire he crooked his fingers slowly and repeatedly, now one at a time, now altogether spreading them wide or making quick, gripping movements. He studied the nail formation and prodded the fingertips now sharply and again softly, gauging the while the nerve sensations produced. It fascinated him and he grew suddenly fond of this subtle flesh of his that worked so beautifully and smoothly and delicately that he would cast a glance of fear at the wolf circle drawn expectantly about him, and like a blow the realization would strike him that this wonderful body of his, this living flesh, was no more than so much meat, a quest of ravenous animals to be torn and slashed by their hungry fangs, to be sustenance to them as the moose and the rabbit had often been sustenance to him. 
He came out of a doze that was half nightmare to see the red-hued she-wolf before him. She was not more than half a dozen feet away, sitting in the snow and wistfully regarding him. The two dogs were whimpering and snarling at his feet, but she took no notice of them. She was looking at the man, and for some time he returned her look. There was nothing threatening about her. She looked at him merely with a great wistfulness, but he knew it to be the wistfulness of an equally great hunger. He was the food, and the sight of him excited in her the gustatory sensations. Her mouth opened, the saliva drooled forth, and she licked her chops with the pleasure of anticipation. A spasm of fear went through him. He reached hastily for a brand to throw at her. But even as he reached, before his fingers had closed on the missile, she sprang back into safety, and he knew that she was used to having things thrown at her. She had snarled as she sprang away, baring her white fangs to their roots, all her wistfulness vanishing, being replaced by a carnivorous malignity that made him shudder. He glanced at the hand that held the brand, noticing the cunning delicacy of the fingers that gripped it, how they adjusted themselves to all the inequalities of the surface, curling over and under and about the rough wood, and one little finger too close to the burning portion of the brand, sensitively and automatically writhing back from the hurtful heat to a cooler, gripping place. And in the same instant, he seemed to see a vision of those same sensitive and delicate fingers being crushed and torn by the white teeth of the she-wolf. Never had he been so fond of this body of his as now when his tenure of it was so precarious. All night with burning brands he fought off the hungry pack. When he dozed, despite himself, the whimpering and snarling of the dogs aroused him. Morning came, but for the first time the light of day failed to scatter the wolves. The man waited in vain for them to go. They remained in a circle about him and his fire, displaying an arrogance of possession that shook his courage born of the morning light. He made one desperate attempt to pull out on the trail. But the moment he left the protection of the fire, the boldest wolf leaped for him, but leaped short. He saved himself by springing back, the jaws snapping together a scant six inches from his thigh. The rest of the pack was now up and surging upon him, and a throwing of firebrands right and left was necessary to drive them back to a respectful distance. Even in the daylight, he did not dare leave the fire to chop fresh wood. Twenty feet away towered a huge dead spruce. He spent half the day extending his campfire to the tree, at any moment a half-dozen burning faggots ready at hand to fling at his enemies. Once at the tree, he studied the surrounding forest in order to fell the tree in the direction of the most firewood. The night was a repetition of the night before save that the need for sleep was becoming overpowering. The snarling of his dogs was losing its efficacy. Besides, they were snarling all the time, and his benumbed and drowsy senses no longer took note of changing pitch and intensity. He awoke with a start. The she-wolf was less than a yard from him. Mechanically, at short range, without letting go of it, he thrust a brand full into her open and snarling mouth. She sprang away, yelling with pain, and while he took delight in the smell of burning flesh and hair, he watched her shaking her head and growling wrathfully a score of feet away. But this time, before he dozed again, he tied a burning pine knot to his right hand. His eyes were closed but a few minutes when the burn of the flame on his flesh awakened him. For several hours he adhered to this program. Every time he was thus awakened, he drove back the wolves with flying brands, replenished the fire, and rearranged the pine knot on his hand. All worked well, but there came a time when he fastened the pine knot insecurely. As his eyes closed, it fell away from his hand. He dreamed. It seemed to him that he was in Fort McGurry, it was warm and comfortable, and he was playing cribbage with the factor. Also, it seemed to him that the fort was besieged by wolves, 
They were howling at the very gates, and sometimes he and the factor paused from the game to listen and laugh at the futile efforts of the wolves to get in. And then, so strange was the dream, there was a crash. The door was burst open. He could see the wolves flooding into the big living room of the fort. They were leaping straight for him and the factor. With the bursting open of the door, the noise of their howling had increased tremendously. This howling now bothered him. His dream was merging into something else. He knew not what, but through it all, following him, persisted the howling. And then he awoke to find the howling real. There was a great snarling and yelping. The wolves were rushing him. They were all about him and upon him. The teeth of one had closed upon his arm. Instinctively, he leaped into the fire. And as he leaped, he felt the sharp slash of teeth that tore through the flesh of his leg. Then began a firefight. His stout mittens temporarily protected his hands, and he scooped live coals into the air in all directions until the campfire took on the semblance of a volcano. But it could not last long. His face was blistering in the heat, his eyebrows and lashes were singed off, and the heat was becoming unbearable to his feet. With a flaming brand in each hand, he sprang to the edge of the fire. The wolves had been driven back. On every side, wherever the live coals had fallen, the snow was sizzling, and every little while a retiring wolf, with wild leap and snort and snarl, announced that one such live coal had been stepped upon. Flinging his brands at the nearest of his enemies, the man thrust his smoldering mittens into the snow and stamped about to cool his feet. His two dogs were missing, and he well knew that they had served as a course in the protracted meal which had begun days before, with Fatty, the last course of which would likely be himself in the days to follow. You ain't got me yet, he cried, savagely shaking his fist at the hungry beasts, and at the sound of his voice the whole circle was agitated, and there was a general snarl, and the she-wolf slid up close to him across the snow and watched him with hungry wistfulness. He set to work to carry out a new idea that had come to him. He extended the fire into a large circle. Inside this circle he crouched, his sleeping outfit under him as a protection against the melting snow. When he had thus disappeared within his shelter of flame, the whole pack came curiously to the rim of the fire to see what had become of him. Hitherto they had been denied access to the fire, and they now settled down in a close-drawn circle, like so many dogs, blinking and yawning and stretching their lean bodies in the unaccustomed warmth. Then the she-wolf sat down, pointed her nose at a star, and began to howl. One by one the wolves joined her, till the whole pack on haunches, with noises pointed skyward, was howling its hunger cry. Dawn came, and daylight. The fire was burning low. The fuel had run out, and there was need to get more. The man attempted to step out of his circle of flame, but the wolves surged to meet him. Burning brands made them spring aside, but they no longer sprang back. In vain he strove to drive them back. As he gave up and stumbled inside his circle, a wolf leaped for him, missed, and landed with all four feet in the coals. It cried out with terror, at the same time snarling, and scrambled back to cool its paws in the snow. The man sat down on his blankets in a crouching position. His body leaned forward from the hips, his shoulders relaxed and drooping, and his head on his knees advertised that he had given up the struggle. Now and again, he raised his head to note the dying down of the fire. The circle of flame and coals was breaking into segments with openings in between. These openings grew in size, the segments diminished. I guess you can come and get me any time, he mumbled. Anyway, I'm going to sleep. Once he wakened, and in an opening in the circle directly in front of him, he saw the she-wolf gazing at him. Again he awakened a little later, though it seemed hours to him. 
A mysterious change had taken place, so mysterious a change that he was shocked wider awake. Something had happened. He could not understand at first. Then he discovered it. The wolves were gone. Remained only the trampled snow to show how closely they had pressed him. Sleep was welling up and gripping him again. His head was sinking down upon his knees when he roused with a sudden start. There were cries of men, the churn of sleds, the creaking of harnesses, and the eager whimpering of straining dogs. Four sleds pulled in from the riverbed to the camp among the trees. Half a dozen men were about the man who was crouched in the center of the dying fire. They were shaking and prodding him to consciousness. He looked at them like a drunken man and maundered in a strange, sleeping speech. Red she-wolf, come in with the dogs at feeding time. First she ate the dog food, then she ate the dogs, and after that she ate Bill. Where's Lord Alfred? One of the men bellowed in his ear, shaking him roughly. He shook his head slowly. No, she didn't need him. He's roosting in the tree at the last camp. Dead? The man shouted. And in a box, Henry answered. He jerked his shoulder petulantly away from the grip of his questioner. Say, you leave me alone. I'm just plum tuckered out. Go night, everybody. His eyes fluttered and went shut. His chin fell forward on his chest. And even as they eased him down upon the blankets, his snores were rising on the frosty air. But there was another sound. Far and faint it was in the remote distance. The cry of the hungry wolf pack as it took the trail of other meat than the man it had just missed. Thank you for visiting the J.W. Jupiter Readers Theatre. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this excerpt from White Fang in the comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe if you enjoyed what you heard. And I'll see you soon on another J.W. Jupiter reading adventure.